So super glad we're here. Today's conversation is going to be a little bit educational. Uh, it's a little bit outside my norm, but uh, I'm up for trying something new. And so for those of you who have a sort of a, what I would call an intellectual pathway, you're probably going to enjoy it. But I want to start out today with a picture. So uh, Beto, I think, is back in the podcast room or the studio here. Berko. Okay, so there's there's three pictures uh, of three different men. The one in the middle is a little blurry. That's my bad. But all three of these men share something in common. Uh, the one on the right you probably recognize is who? Do you know who that picture is? Bill Walton. The guy in the middle is a name. His name is Jason Williams, and the far the guy on the far left is a guy by the name of Grayson Murray. Grayson Murray and Jason Williams and Bill Walton. This last week or so, all three of them have died. That's one thing they share in common. Grayson Murray, 30 years old, professional golfer. Kind of came up with the ranks of Jake Knapp. Many of you are in relationship with Jake Knapp. Jake's a local Costa Mesa kid. He's a graduate of Estancia High School. He and Grayson basically have come up uh, in the ranks of golf. And last weekend, while playing in a tournament after the second round, Grayson Murray went home, left his Range Rover running in his garage, went upstairs to go to sleep, and he never woke up because the carbon monoxide from his car, it's, it's lethal and it was intentional. Now here's what's interesting about Grayson. Grayson was a born again Christian. In the last year he's turned his life around and, and everybody knows sort of his story. And so one of the questions about people will ask is, when you take your own life, which Grayson did, does God invite that person into heaven? Or does he send them to hell? You have an opinion about that? Do you know what the Bible teaches about that? The guy in the middle, his name is Jason Williams. Jason and I uh, had a casual uh, relationship. He worked as a career as an anesthesiologist. And I knew Jason to be a man who had friends in high places. He was a guy who was politically uh, connected. And so although Jason had... Uh, both what, what I think we could safely say, both fame and fortune, both money and influence, at the age of 52, Jason died unexpectedly, leaving behind his family and two teenage sons. And his death, like Grayson's Murray's, impacted me this past week. And then last Sunday, Bill Murray, or Bill Walton, most of you probably have seen a lot on Bill Walton. He's a uh, NBA Hall of Famer basketball player. He's a telephone or a TV personality. Uh, he's he's a lover of all music, especially that by which band? Anybody know? The Grateful Dead, right? And at the age of 71, Bill Walton died from cancer. Now, I never had a relationship with Bill Walton, but his death also touched my heart for different reasons. And so this past week, as, I, as I've been reading sort of the, the social media reports and the posts on the death of all three of these particular men, my observation, based upon people's response, has reinforced this conviction, that people are interested in eternity. People are interested in eternity. People are interested in the life hereafter. So my question for you today is, is that a subject that interests you? Are you interested in eternity? You know, when we read the Bible, particularly the New Testament portion of it, we can read about a a group of early church believers, Christians, who had a reputation for being concerned about eternity. This group of early church believers lived in the city of Thessalonica, which was at the time the capital city of the, the region or the kingdom, so to speak, of Macedonia, which was in the, located geographically in sort of northern Greece. Uh, Alexander the Great, you ever heard of him? His birthplace was 
was this town here in, in Thessalonica, this Macedonia. He came from that area. Now, if you have a Bible with you today, we're going to look at a number of passages of Scripture, but we're going to start our conversation in the book of 1 Thessalonians. So Thessalonians is toward the end of your Bible. You get Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. You get all the way past Corinthians, and then you're going to find Thessalonians. And so we're going to read, if you have it in paper or digital form, I encourage you to, to always check out what we're reading because I don't want you to just take it my word for what, we, what I'm saying. It's good for you to you know, put it up against God's word to make sure that this is what God's word is actually saying. And I'm going to read out a New Living Translation, verses 1, 2, and 3. Follow along in your, in your scriptures or on the screen with me. This is what we're told. This letter... Is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. So three guys are sort of writing this, this letter. We're writing to the church in Thessalonica, to you who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, may God give you grace and peace. So Paul, who is Paul? He's kind of one of the earliest Christians of, of, of followers of Jesus. He, he becomes this church planter as a, after the Lord... Uh, saves him from his, his, his religion as a Jew. He becomes this Christ follower. He starts planting all these churches, one of which is this group of people who live in, the, in Thessalonica. And he's writing to these Christians who are living there. Look at verse 2. He says, We thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly as we pray to our God and, as we pray to our God and Father about you. We think of three things. Check this out. We think of your faithful work your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me stop here for a second. Paul writes in the Bible two letters to this group of Christians. The, this letter called 1 Thessalonians is letter number one. So guess what 2 Thessalonians is? It's letter number, number two. And here in verse 3, we can read Paul's affirmation to the Thessalonian believers. What he likes about this group of Christians living in Thessalonica, and in verse 3, there's three things that he commends them for, three things that these early church Christians of Thessalonica were known for. Write this down in your app notes. Number one, they're known for their faithful work. They're known for their faithful work. What's that? Well... It's basically their local community impact. Remember when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? What did Jesus say? Love God, right? With all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And love who? Love your neighbors, yourself. And so part of, one of the things that this Thessalonica group of Christians was known for was their influence in the local community. We're going to unpack that a little bit more. Write this down. Number two. The second thing that Paul commends them for and that they're known for is their loving deeds. In other words, this is a group of people that have this reputation for caring for the needs of each other within the group, within the family, so to speak. A relationship with Jesus is not just upward, but it's also outward, right? And so they were known for that. And then thirdly, the last thing that he commends them for is that somehow these Thessalonica Christians had established this reputation as a group of people who were looking forward to the return of Christ. They lived with, write this down, an anticipation of Christ's return. An anticipation of Christ's return. In fact, if you look forward at verse 10 in your Bibles, you will be told that these people were, were they were looking for when Jesus Christ, God's Son, was going to come back from heaven and basically usher in eternity. Now, here's my point. Like the people of today, the people of old had an interest in eternity. Which leads us back to the question I asked you early, earlier. Do you have an eye on eternity? You know, as a pastor... When I look at Palm Harvest Church... And remember, church is what? It's people, right? It's not a building. And so when I look at this group of people who call themselves a part of the Palm Harvest Church, in my opinion, full disclosure, I propose that Palm Harvest looks very similar to this church in Thessalonica. For example, like the Thessalonians, we have a community influence. Would you agree with that? 
Have you guys all heard of the, the, the group called Costa Mesa United? Are you familiar with that group? I want you to watch this video. Beto, do we have this video? Okay, watch this video. It's two minutes long, but I want you to watch it. And specifically, I want you to see if there's any people in this video who are also part of Palm Harvest Church. Okay, check this out. I think it was 1991, Jim Scott went into the superintendent's office and said, here's $100. This is the beginning of a stadium at Estancia High School and an aquatic center at Costa Mesa High School. Uh, I can tell you for a number of years, we never thought that was gonna happen. The fundraising was real slow, and then the, the bond measure came through, we were able to get it through, and then um, Gordon, Gordon and the guys perfect. at Costa Mesa you know, really jumped into another arena of what else can we do to help youth athletics in the city of Costa Mesa. It's really kind of Better. morphed into something bigger than I think they ever really ever imagined it to be. The support that Costa Mesa United has provided our programs has allowed not only for those programs to excel and we see it in, in wins over losses, uh, the fact that our community is giving back to our schools means that our schools and our students are helping out in the community more likely because of their participation in athletics. It sounds kind of cliche, but sports keeps kids out of trouble. It keeps them focused, it keeps them committed. Costa Mesa United is dedicated to youth sports in Costa Mesa and we are dedicated to improving fields and equipment for those youth sports. The kind of stuff that we fund are things that don't walk away. They're assets. And we're gonna buy things that actually physically stay at the site and, and help accentuate the youth athletics experience for the kids. So now we've got the city deeply involved, we've got the school district very supportive, and then all the youth sports. So when we sit down, we can get things done. And that, that's the great thing. If it wasn't for Costa Mesa United and the support that they give to our schools, we wouldn't see the, the kinds of, of athletic success that we're seeing currently. They've made kids proud of being from Costa Mesa and proud of being part of Estancia High School. And uh, without Costa Mesa United, we, we wouldn't be in the shape that we're in right now. There is not a neighboring community that I know that has an organization with people, the leaders who care about youth sports, that care about the development of children, that care about giving back to the community. And that's what it's about. We love their dollars, but we really love the spirit that they give to our community, that servant leadership, that giving back. That's really what our, we want our kids to walk away with. Jim Scott's dream is alive and well in, in that they see um, Costa Mesa not for what it was, but for what it will be. What it's done is it's lit a fire. That stadium was a sign of the commitment in the hearts of a lot of us to say never will we turn our back on the most important asset in our community and that's our kids. Excellent. Costa Mesa, you guys are a lot skinnier now than you were in that video. A lot of people though from this church family, what's that tell us? We are churches involved in, in the community. I got a phone call this last week from one of our lieutenants at the Coast Mesa Police Department. And he said, hey, Mike, is Palm Harvest going to do your barbecue this year for the 4th of July? Interesting. How many years we'll be doing it? This will be our 25th year. How old's Hunter? 25. Okay, so we've been doing this as long as Hunter's been alive. That's a long time. And now the police are calling us and saying, hey, are you guys going to do this? You know, Jerry Geisland serves down there as a volunteer. Obviously, I'm involved with this as a chaplaincy. We are involved in the community. Many of you are involved in, in a group called Trellis, which is basically this organization that helps us be involved with homelessness and education and, and you know, prayer and, and various initiatives, neighboring. And I, I, I want to say to you that when I read this, this about this group of Christians who the Apostle Paul is affirming for their faithful work in the city, I believe that if Paul were here, he would say to you, brothers and sisters, well done, good job, you are representing Jesus in your faithful work. The second thing, like the Philippian Christians, that I propose that we're doing a pretty good job at is caring for one another. I know that many of you here today, and I have first-hand experience where you as a church family are generously and anonymously sharing your money to meet the needs of people in this family. And the reason I know that is because many times you will ask me to be your messenger and your deliverer of your philanthropic, spiritually motivated, anonymous generosity. 
And again, I say to you, brothers and sisters, well done. I think that as Christians, as followers of Jesus, as he's changing as our life, he is calling you and he's causing you and he's developing within you this desire to love on your neighbor. But now I look at this third quality, and I don't have an answer really for this. This third quality about eternity, I encourage you to evaluate your own life on this. Would you say that you are a person who lives your life with this heightened perspective, this heightened anticipation that Jesus could come back at any moment? Do you live your daily life with this expectation about eternity, about heaven, or have you been or are you distracted? Could you do better? You know, a lot of times we'll ask each other accountability questions in our, our men's Bible study on Monday nights, and one of the answers a lot of the guys will say is, I could do better. I could do better. Do you live your life with an eye on eternity? So pull out that card that, that you got when you came in. Okay, everybody pull out this card. And if you don't have one, raise your hand, and Joe's probably got a few extra here. Okay, Joe, can you help, can you help us out there? I want you to look at this card. This card showcases this new sermon series that we are starting today. Armando Pacheco, I want to give him props for this. He's the one who he drafted this particular artwork. And this is how it works. Armando, I'll say to Armando, Armando, I have a theme in mind. In this case, eternity. And I don't give him much more than that. Because I don't want to influence him as an artist. And so he'll start drawing and he'll come back to me and then Beto and, and I, and in this case even Joseph got involved a little bit. We'll give this, this feedback and we'll say, well, this is kind of what I'm looking for. And I have some ideas then that I'll, I'll start, we'll start to sprinkle. The theme is eternity and this is where we landed. But when you look at this logo, and I encourage you to really start to dive into this over the next week. Is anybody take a guess at to what story is depicted in this logo? Any ideas? Go to Matthew chapter 24. Let me give you a hint. We're going to read a couple passages of scripture. I got some time here. Matthew chapter 24. Let me set the context for you. Jesus is sitting on a hillside. He's been out preaching to his, to the people. And, and as we're about to read, he, he gathers personally with a group of his closest disciples and they ask him a question. Basically, they're asking him about eternity. Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to start reading at verse 3. This is what we read. Picture the scene in your mind. So later, Jesus sat on, sat on the Mount of Olives and his disciples came to him privately and they said, tell us what sign will signal your return and the end of the world. So they're thinking about the eternity. They're thinking about heaven. They're thinking about the next step in life. So Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many and you will hear of wars and threats of wars. But don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nations will go to war against nations and kingdom against kingdom. Are we seeing that today? You know, I don't know where you stand on the whole, this last, the news of this last week with the prosecution of, of president, former president Donald Trump. But what I do know is that this is the divisive issue. And what COVID couldn't do in terms of breaking apart families, kingdoms against kingdoms, I see that taking place. Jesus said it's going to happen. Be on your alert. He said there's going to be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all of this is only the first of birth, plane, birth pains which, with more to come. He said, you're going to be arrested and persecuted and killed. Oh, that's happening. You'll be hated all over the world because you're my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. In other words, the loving our neighbor and our, our friends and our families, it's going to grow cold. He says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. 
Now go to the next chapter, look at chapter 25, which leads us to this logo. So Jesus continues, he tells them the story, he says, the kingdom heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. So look at this logo again. What's this woman holding in her hand? She's holding a lamp, okay? Then there's a whole lot more to this logo if you look at it, and we'll get into it in the weeks to come. But this is the basis of this. She is headed, she's got her eye on heaven. So what's Jesus say? He says, of these ten bride, uh, bridesmaids or virgins your Bible might have, they took their lamps and they went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. Now here in this Bible story, there are, Jesus references at least three what we would call theological concepts that the disciples would have been very aware of in their day and age. In your app notes, I want you to write these down if you can. Number one, the bridesmaids. This is Bible class 101 today, everybody. Bridesmaids equals the church. You and me, in this story, we are the bridesmaids. The bridegroom in this story is Jesus. And the wedding feast or the wedding banquet is heaven. What Jesus is having this conversation about eternity and he uses this example of these bridesmaids and this bridegroom and heaven represented by the wedding feast. And what I want you to know, what I want to be, you to be reminded of today is that you are God's bride. In fact, I would love for you to say together in unison this phrase, I am God's bride. I am God's bride. You ready on the count of three? One, two, three. Now turn to your neighbor and say, you are God's bride. So friends, understand that we are bride. When you, when you read the Old Testament, we're not going to take time, and maybe Beto, you can put the scriptures up on the screen behind me or in front of us. In the book of Hosea, chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, we can read where the nation of Israel is called the bride. And the bridegroom is God the Father. And from the very beginning of scriptures, we can read this story where God, our creator, is saying, I want to have an intimate relationship with you. I'm the bridegroom. You're the bride. And Jesus incorporates this theological idea into his story. Now, in his story, this, in chapter 25, he gives us three admonitions, and I'm going to end with this. So write this down for those of you taking notes. We would be wise to embrace these three admonitions that Jesus tells us. Number one, he encourages his disciples to stay awake. Stay awake. Number two, he tells us as his bride to be prepared. Make sure that you got enough oil in your lamp to burn so when the bridegroom comes back, you're ready. And then number three, expect his return. Expect Jesus' return. He could come back at any moment. The bridegroom is coming back, sisters and brothers. Are you ready? For this series, let me end with this. 
We're going to work through 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, these two letters. We might even start in 2 Thessalonians and skip 1 Thessalonians. I don't know. Because Thessalonians, the whole idea of 2 Thessalonians is this letter that Paul was reminding these Christians who are doing a super job in their community. And they're doing super job. They are a healthy church, much like Paul Marvis. He's saying, in the midst of all of that, don't lose sight of the bigger picture. And that's Christ is coming back. Are you ready? Because when he comes back, and if you're sleeping at the wheel, you're going to miss him. And you're going to be knocking on the door. Can I get in? Can I get in? Can I get in? And from what Jesus is telling us here, it's like, no. One of the questions people often ask is, Pastor Mike, can a person lose their salvation? That's an eternity question. You have strong opinions about that? Important stuff. This may be the most meaty, deep down, biblical study and conversation I have ever done in my, in my whole ministry. Are you guys ready for this? Yes. Jesus calls us to live like the early church believers. Love our neighbors in the community. Love each other. And keep an eye on eternity. And I think we would be wise to do what he suggests. So let's close with a prayer, okay? We'll call it our preparation intro eternity prayer. So put your palms out in front of you, open up. This prayer is going to have two parts. The first part, I'm going to ask you to pray for yourself. And the second part, I'm going to ask you to pray for me. Okay, so everybody take a deep breath. Hold it. Exhale. Now in your heart, pray this. Say, Jesus, I want to grow spiritually. And I want to grow in my understanding of heaven and eternity. So please increase my ability to learn. Deep breath in. Exhale. Now pray this. Say, Jesus, please guide and help Pastor Mike lead us on this spiritual journey. Please increase his capacity to communicate complex stuff simply. This is my prayer. Deep breath, everybody. Exhale. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said... Amen. Eternity. It matters. We never know when our last breath might be. Could be at the age of 30. Could be at the age of 52. Could be at the age of 71. Hopefully not for a while yet for all of us. Are you ready? Lord, I pray for us as a church family that you would help us not to fall asleep at the wheel. We want our lives to be fruitful, God. We want our lives to be impactful. We want to make a difference. And this church is filled with individuals who are doing that. We saw this video clip. I hear this testimonies in our city about how Palm Harvest Church members are making a difference. Awesome stuff, Lord. I pray that you're honored by that. But all of this would be worthless, Lord, if we don't make it to heaven. If somehow we get distracted by just life and the goodness that you blessed us with. So help us to stay alert. Help us to stay sharp and attentive. I pray that you pour out your blessing upon all of us today, Lord, for your kingdom glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen.